All right, let's um, a wiggle apparently into our uh, our second play of the semester and our uh, also our second comedy. Okay, so here on this page you'll find a bit of background and history, um, dates for the play, uh, that sort of thing. Um, Twelfth Night itself refers to uh, the twelfth day of Christmas, if you are curious, um, and it, uh, subsequently the Feast of Epiphany, which celebrates uh, the arrival of the three magi to uh, see uh, the infant Jesus. Um, one good reason for possibly, one possible good reason for performing it on, one possible good reason for the name is because it might have been performed on this date. Um, or commissioned for Twelfth Night festivities, although we don't have any records one way or another to um, to prove or refute this. Um, but uh, in Shakespeare's time, Epiphany was a very important holiday. It was actually more important than Christmas because not only did it um, represent the coming of the Magi of the Three Kings, but it also um, was when Christ's baptism was celebrated as well as the miracle at Cana. Uh, which are also other, you know, biblical stories. Uh, the title's real significance, however, lies in the uh, the festival of Twelfth Night, um, because it, it's tied to the ancient Roman tradition, um, the, the holiday of Saturnalia. Uh, Saturnalia was um, celebrated uh, as like the winter solstice. You know, it was it was the winter festival, the winter holiday, and. Um, one of the ways that it was uh, celebrated was through role reversal, role reversal between uh, master and servant, um, role playing that sort of thing and mask wearing. Um, by Shakespeare's time, uh, Twelfth Night was was celebrated much to the chagrin of the of the church um, by by abandoning the normal rules uh, by which you lived your life. Um, and instead reverting to singing and revelry and excessive eating and drinking. So kind of think of Mardi Gras or Carnival, and uh, you kind of have an idea of what this like and what this festival was about. Um, but it's also also worth noting the clever uh, title, because I'm sure you noticed it's not just Twelfth Night, it's Twelfth Night, comma, or what you will. Um, a lot of comedies have these vague titles, you know, Much Ado About Nothing, What You Will, that sort of thing. Um, and the interesting thing about this one is uh, what you will is um, a very flippant and um, generic title, but it has a, a thinly veiled meaning that actually has quite a bit to do with the action in the play, like we saw much to do about nothing, had a lot to do with overhearing and those sorts of things. Um, this this uh, thinly, thinly veiled um, meaning is, uh, comes from multiple definitions for the word will. So, will for Elizabethans also meant wish or, or incantation, you know, um, the idea uh, that uh, taking the play and, and adapting it to your, you know, the viewer's will, you know, whatever, what, what you will, whatever you imagine it to be, whatever you wish it to be, that's what it is kind of thing. Um, it's not the only time uh, we see in plays the idea of putting the onus on the audience to make the play what what you want it to be. Um, Will also had a secondary meaning of, uh, or tertiary, tertiary meaning, of irrational desire and passion, um, very often physical passion, uh, and, and kind of potentially like that sort of out of control um, of good judgment type of, of lustful, youthful inability to control yourself. Um, so with those two things kind of in mind, you can see uh, how the wills of the people in this play um, are, are the driving force of the action. Um, you know, Orsino's for Olivia, um, and even, you know, for Viola uh, as, as a Cesario to a bit, to an extent, uh, before he knows that, that she's a woman. Um, Olivia's sudden and passionate love for Cesario, Antonio's devotion uh, to Sebastian, and even Malvolio's ambitions, <clears throat> you know, are all examples of this passionate, uncontrolled will, as well as some of the other characters' will to just keep on partying, despite the fact that nobody wants them to. 
Woo, pardon me. Okay. So, as you're familiar uh, with this week, we're gonna we're gonna touch on these briefly. Questions. Um, what does this play uh, have in common with Much Ado About Nothing? Um, and using these two as, as your your litmus test, as your examples of a of comedies, what can you um, extract in terms of the genre uh, of comedy itself? Um, we'll touch on this some actually in this lecture, but there are many different kinds of fools in Twelfth Night, and what are the differences between the different kinds? Um, I hope you saw some of that already. Uh, and then, what is it about these characters? that uh, allows them to rise above uh, personal jest and, and still seem relatable today. You know, what about, what about these characters makes you feel for them, you know? A few things to watch out for and things that we'll touch on as well. Role reversals, should have seen that one coming. Uh, the power of the written word is, is something that's really important in this play. It's a, it's a little bit more... Um, I, perhaps a little bit more nuanced than role reversals. Role reversals is a gimme. Um, mentions of music and where music is, is being played and, and what it refers to and what it means and that sort of thing. And then the idea of having or wanting anything uh, in excess, more than you need of it. All right. Our literary terms for the week. <clears throat> uh, we're going to talk about puns. So um, we all probably know vaguely of what a pun is, but I want you in particular um, to be on the lookout for uh, different kinds of puns. So there are two here. So there's the um, antanaclasis here, which is the repetition of a word in two different senses. Uh, so when Feste says, I live by the church, and Cesario slash Viola says, Oh, so you're a churchman, you're a clergyman. And he says, no, my house is by the church, so I live by the church. Um, you know, he's obviously punning on the multiple meanings of the phrase to live by. Uh, and then there's also paranomasia, which is when uh, two words sound alike, um, but they have different meanings. So unlike the first one being the exact same word who has different meanings, these are words that simply sound alike. Um, so when Orsino says that he will hunt the heart, uh, he's referring to the word for deer. Um, but the way that he talks about hunting um, refers to the heart, H-E-A-R-T. Like, you know, um, I'm hunting Olivia's heart, that kind of thing. Speaking of written words and crap, um, let's, uh, we'll, we'll quick touch on the, um, the different forms of the text here, and you'll see, obviously, these in, in this play and all the others, and I, I mentioned them briefly in, uh, our lecture for Much Ado About Nothing. Um, this chart here should hopefully be helpful in showing where, uh, the different terms fall in the scale of the rigidity of form. So, uh, at the bottom you've got prose, uh, and prose is free-flowing, it is unmetered and it doesn't rhyme. So prose is what um, what people like you and I speak in. It's what we write in, like in, in terms of it doesn't it doesn't have that sort of structure uh, that that verse does. Um, it's also the only one on this list that is in a form of poetry. Maybe that's the easiest way to say it. Um, the next step up is verse. Verse is always metered, um, so it's it's you know iambic pentameter we talked about, but um, but um, but um, but um, but um, um, that's a meter, that that cadence, that beat, and so there's blank verse which is unrhymed, and then rhyming verse which is rhymed verse, um, and then above that are sonnets, and sonnets are verse that have a rhyme scheme and a set number of lines, like in iambic pentameter. Um, Romeo and Juliet, fun fact, when they first meet, their first uh, lines form a perfect sonnet uh, in their first interaction, which is very romantic, yes. Um, it definitely would have come across that way to the audience. They would have gotten that. 
Um, and then, of course, at the top is song, because song has a melody on top of the rhyming verse. So it's the most um, advanced. Uh, I'd also like to put forth the idea that while poetry may seem like something that is no longer around today, um, and and verse is a little bit looser, we, we still have rhyming, definitely, but... Um, yeah. Music and songs have have largely taken over the, the poetic scene. You know, your favorite lyrics without music are a poem. Anyway, um, looking at these different forms of writing, it, at first glance, it kind of may seem like Shakespeare uh, uses verse and prose to indicate a character's status, like high or low, um, rich or power, rich and powerful, educated, not educated, um, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, with, with poor and common people speaking in, in prose and, and fancy people speaking in verse and sonnets and all that stuff. Um, and they definitely do, but uh, I think upon a closer look you might even notice um, that many characters go back and forth um, between verse and prose. And they do it, they tend to do it at very specific moments in the play. So, what does that mean? Um, it either means that we can ignore it entirely or we can use it as clues for how a character might be feeling or reacting. If you've been speaking, you know, in flowered verse and then all of a sudden you drop into prose, maybe you lost your cool. I don't know, something like that. Um, another interesting thing is to notice which characters and when uh, finish their scenes or finish their you know their own lines when they exit or leave with a rhyming couplet like we would see at the end of the sonnets uh, Olivia does this uh, she oh time thou must untangle this not I it is too hard a knot for me to untie and then she leaves you know so she rhymes her last two lines uh, as a like official little exit type thing Anyway, moving on. Okay, stock characters. Last week we talked about the natural villain, the bastard, or, the, or last, not last week, last play. Forgive me, it's been a long day. Um, so this play, our stock character, uh, is the fool. And we're going to talk about both types, actually. Witty fools and foolish wits. Um, we've got two characters here that you have already met. Um, and I want you to think about these different types as you continue to read. Um, both of these characters are called fools um, and were in Shakespeare's time. Both would be referred to as fools. But they are markedly different men, aren't they? Um, so as we talked about earlier, you know, how would you describe Feste versus uh, how would you describe Sir Andrew? Um, and at what point, especially in this play, this play in particular is very good for examining fools uh, because as I already touched on, everybody at some point in time in this play is, is made a fool of, um, which is great. And fun for us, right? Alrighty, so now we're finally... Um, 13 minutes into the lecture, we're going to get started on the play. The play begins. Yay! A uh, quick rundown of the action so far. Act 1, scene 1. If music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it. Uh, we, we see Orsino, Duke Orsino here, pining over this woman um, that we hear of, Olivia. Uh, I'll spoil something for you here, in case you didn't notice. Everybody wants Olivia. Um it seems, except for one person. Anyway, Orsino belabors his sad, lovesick state. Uh, though we do, you know, almost immediately um, during his monologue uh, here, uh, monologue, you know, of single speak, you know, one person, one person talking, one big old chunk of text by one person. It's a monologue. Anyway. Um, we see here in his monologue, by the end of it, he says, Enough! No more! Tis not so sweet as it was before. So he's already uh, super inconsistent. He's like, I want a million pancakes! And then he gets a quarter of the way through the pancakes, and he's like, Oh, I hate pancakes. I guess. But with music. Um, so, 
it's it's definitely an interesting thing to start his character off with right off the bat. And so think about here. I am gonna time for Khaki's opinion. Um, insert it right here. As you read the play, do you like Orsino because he's um, he's a very divisive character. I feel like I've met a lot of people who don't like him. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, so Act 2. We uh, meet Viola. She has survived a shipwreck. We find out that she might have lost her brother. Super tragic. Um, but don't worry, don't worry. It's, it's a comedy, guys. It's a comedy. It'll be okay. Um, Duke Orsino, uh, she's informed, is uh, one option to go to and throw herself at the mercy of... Uh, that was a horrible sentence. She has the option to go to two different very wealthy individuals who might be able to give her shelter. Those two people are Duke Orsina and the wealthy uh, Lady Olivia. So those are her options. Um, Olivia uh, is not taking any guests at the moment. Um, and we find out that's because she's in mourning because of the passing of her brother, which makes Viola and Olivia, you know, quite similar in this way. They've both lost their brothers. Uh, anyway, so she decides, okay, then I'll go to the Duke. Uh, disguise me as a eunuch, as, you know, a young man. Um, and I'll go to the Duke in his service. Because, um, and th maybe that seems like a weird thing to do. I don't know if it's necessary to say this or not, but it was a lot easier at this point in time to be a man than it was to be a woman. And so pretending to be a eunuch gave her a lot more freedom. Unfortunately. Okay, so anyway, we move on to Act Act 1, Scene 3, and we get to see Olivia's household. Um, these are, on, on your screen here, you've got the people who are, who are living with her, um, who, who live inside of, of her household and such. Anyway, so we know already that Olivia is a wealthy woman, um, and she's inherited her father's ownings uh, since her brother has died. Um, she runs the house entirely by herself, and she's very, she's very attractive, uh, to many, many men in this play. Um, perhaps it's because she's smart and beautiful, uh, or perhaps it's because she has so much property to her name. Let's be romantic and say it's both, instead of just the latter one. Anyway, so here's when we see her own king, kinsman. Uh, Toby Belch, Sir Toby Belch, um, who has brought the foolish wit Sir Andrew Aguicheek uh, to to court her. Um, we very very quickly discover that Toby likes living um, a life of luxury and drunkenness, and uh, that Andrew is paying for it. So Toby is definitely not looking to lose. Andrew's company anytime soon. So even though even Andrew himself doubts that Olivia likes him, he's like, wait a second, why am I, I don't know that she likes me. I don't know that, that I'll really get to marry her. Um, you know, he doubts his ability to win, win her over, which is very astute of him actually, oddly enough. Um, but, but Toby is encouraging him anyway. Uh, right after we see Toby, we, uh, we get this great line from him that kind of sums up uh, his character. He says, What a plague my niece means to take the death of her brother thus. I am sure care is an enemy to life. It's a very famous Toby line. I am sure care is an enemy to life. <clears throat> so, by Act 1, Scene 4, Viola has already disguised herself as Cesario and endeared herself to the Duke. Um, so much so that he has asked her to woo Olivia in his stead because Olivia won't take his suits anymore. Um, but at this point in time, Viola, poor Vo Viola Cesario, uh, confesses to the audience that she herself has fallen in love with the Duke, uh, with Orsino. So these two very quickly have fallen into each other's good graces. 
you know like how how did how did he woo her unintentionally uh how did she earn his trust so quickly you know i'm not saying i'm not saying there's an answer i'm saying it's an it's an interesting question to think about um act one scene five the fool arrives on the scene um and and with his wits, where's my book? And with his his wits, he outwits uh, Olivia from, from the righteousness of her mourning. She tries to, you know, uh, remove all mirth from her life and, and send him away, even though, you know, he's been her fool before, and they, they have a history, although he's the fool has been gone for a while. Um, I'm going to read here, because it's great. Uh, Olivia says, you know, take the fool away and uh and, and the fool says good madonna which in case anybody does not know madonna means my lady in french ma my donna lady just a thing that you know now if you didn't before good madonna give me leave to prove you a fool and she says can you do it dexterously good madonna fine make your proof I must catchize you for it, Madonna. Good, my mouse of virtue, answer me. He's calling her my mouse of virtue, like my my little, my little, um, my good virtuous mouse, my good little student kind of thing. Um. Anyway, uh, answer me. Well, sir, for want of other idleness, I'll bid you proof. I got nothing else going on. Fine, go, say it, do it, whatever. And he says, good Madonna, why mournst thou? Good fool for my brother's death. I think his soul in hell, the Madonna. I know his soul is in heaven, fool. The more fool Madonna to mourn for your brother's soul being in heaven. Take away the fool, gentlemen. So this is just a clumsily read, very, very cutesy start to... Uh, you know, our enjoyment of the fool on stage. <clears throat> Sorry. Today is like feeling rough edition. Anyway. Um, Viola then uh, arrives and attempts to uh, woo Olivia for Cesario because he wants Olivia and, and Viola can't find it in her to not do it for him, I guess. I say these things like, like I don't know. I mean, I don't know. There is no right answer. That's, that's the thing about literature. It's all subjective. So anyway, enough about that. So anyway, Viola attempts to woo Olivia as Cesario for Orsino. But Olivia falls for Viola as Cesario. So, I guess the most important question to ask when reading this is why? Why does Olivia fall for, for Cesario, you know? It, and, and that question informs a lot of your staging and a lot of your choice choices as, as a director and as actors and, and all sorts of things like that. Um, my opinion, it's time for Kagi's opinion, twice, twice in one lecture, um, is that she fell for the one person that she couldn't have. She, every, everything else, you know, everybody else wants her, and she fell for the one person um, that, that didn't want her. The other options, there are many, many, many other options, is that, is that or, you know, Viola woos so effectively. And perhaps the problem of having somebody else woo in your stead is that they might be successful. For example, Claudio was really worried that the uh, prince was wooing for himself when uh, when he was wooing Hero. So maybe um, maybe do you all your own flirting is the is the moral of the story. Anyway, I strongly recommend you watch the scene that I shared in the in the folder right now. Uh, even if you already watched it, I recommend you do it again because it's super good and 
they do a tremendous they just do a tremendous job of bringing it to life and they actually also do period appropriate clothes and they all this particular performance is all men because at the time as we all know women weren't allowed on stage and so it's it's just it's really good just pause on my face doing this okay. uh, finally before we move on the still from this slide is actually from a production that I saw um, where the woman who played Olivia did a marvelous job of being absolutely head over heels uh, for Cesario um, and she definitely, she definitely did a great job of playing a woman who was not used to hearing uh, no. Um, it was very good. It was very good. Okay, act two. Scene one. Another rescue. Sebastian's not lost after all. Woo! I told you he wouldn't be. It's a comedy. Don't worry about it. And he... He's telling Antonio about uh, Viola, and he speaks so very highly of his sister. Um, they're twins, and they're very close, uh, which, you know, makes, makes the rest of the mistaken identity uh, thing, you know, very funny. Um, uh, there, there are many ways uh, to, to tell that, um, that, they, that they've been made, that they're supposed to be the same, that they mirror each other on stage, a lot of very similar actions, very similar... Uh, traits, you know, um, habits, that sort of thing that might come from being very close siblings uh, and, and, you know, also uh, add to the conclu or c conclusion, add to the confusion, um, you know, uh, of, of a sister dressing like a brother um, on purpose uh, and, and, and causing mayhem because of it. Uh, you know, to us, of course, it is it is a little bit of a stretch um, to see two, you know, a, a woman and a man be be so very mistaken for each other. Sure, you know, you might as well address that fact. Um, but but there are liberties in their dramatic licenses that are uh, we allow in movies, you know, and shows and plays and that sort of thing. Uh, suspension of um, disbelief, as it were. Um, and, and we do this in, in order for the, the story to entertain us. Um, we allow them the irrational, the far-fetched, the, the stretches of realistic expectation, um, you know, to a degree. But you can't abuse that trust. That's a, that's a very important thing in literature is you can't ab ab abuse um, artistic license. Um, although I will say, as shown above, or above, above, right here. I'm sorry, you guys. As shown right here, this is a great example of how they could look incredibly alike. Um, again, in Shakespeare's day, having both of these characters played by men definitely makes it uh, easier for the two of them to look super similar. Maybe the audience had a hard time uh, telling them apart. So yeah. Anyway, so Antonio decides to follow Sam Sebastian uh, to be his servant, you know, even though he has enemies in Orsino's court. Because he's a loyal servant. What can I say? All right. Um, act two, scene two. Uh, Viola discovers Olivia's love through um, through this ring that that Malvolio brings back. Um, you know, her her monologue here shows uh, a little bit of empowerment of of the liberation of being a man. Um, and then at the end, she still leaves it to t uh, for time to unravel rather than her. So she kind of gives back <laughs> that empowerment a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read and we'll go through her uh, monologue here. So Malvolio is like, take the ring back. Um, my lady said that she doesn't want it from Orsino. And so here, <laughs> and throws it on the ground because Malvolio is a jerk. So then he leaves, and she says, I left no ring with her. What means this lady? And she picks up the ring. Fortune forbid my outside have not charmed her. You know, fortune forbid me dressing like a man didn't make her think I was a dude, and then she fell in love with me. She made good view of me indeed so much that me thought her eyes had lost her tongue. She definitely checked she checked me out, you know, uh, and she started stuttering. Um, 
and everything. For she did speak and starts distractedly, which is which is a great um, built-in uh, direction to the character playing Viola, uh, which um, Mark Rylance does a great job in, in the in the scene that we watched of doing the stuttering that uh, that Viola refers to here. And I just said Viola, and I meant Olivia, and you knew I meant Olivia because you're totally probably on it today, unlike me. Anyway, she loves me, sure. The cunning of her passion invites me in this churlish messenger. Churlish means rude uh, or mean, and obviously Malvolio is the churlish messenger here. None of my lord's ring? Why, he sent her none. I am the man. If it be so, as tis, poor lady, she were better love a dream. Disguise, I see thou art a wickedness, wherein the pregnant enemy does much. And in here, um, nobody is having a baby. Pregnant uh, means resourceful uh, in this instance. And the enemy is Satan. So Satan, Satan does a lot with um, disguise and trickery. Uh, uses it to his advantage is, is what's being said here. Ah, uh, la 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 la. How easy it is for the proper false in woman's waxen hearts to set the forms. Alas, our frailty is the cause, not we. For such as we are made of, such we be. So, um, he's saying man, women, she's saying man, women are impressionable. But it's not our fault, so that's how we are made. Um, there was a belief in the day that um, women were weaker vessels. Uh, which, of course, we ladies know nowadays is not true. Um, but that's, that's just what they believed. So that's where you can see it here. Um, how will this fadge? My master loves her dearly. Fadge means how will this work out? How will this work out? My master loves her dearly. And I, poor monster, found, fond as much of him. Monster because she is both a man and a woman, so she's a monster, I guess. Not, I guess. Anyway. I'm a mess. Poor monster. Fond as much on him. And she, mistaken, seems to dote on me. What will become of this? As I am man, my state is desperate for my master's love. As I am woman, now alas by day. What thriftless sighs shall poor Olivia breathe? What, what, Thriftless meaning useless, fruitless size. Like her, her doting on me, you know, her yearning for me is all in vain because I'm not what she thinks I am. And then the the couplet we mentioned earlier, and and the fact that she leads us to time to unravel that I've already alluded to. Oh, time, thou must untangle this, not I. It is too hard a knot for me to untie. Exempt. Very fancy. Very good job. All right, Act Two, Scene Three. We've got pranks and merrymaking, as is Sir Toby and Maria and Andrew's um, natural state of being. Uh, so they're all partying. Uh, Toby and, and, and Andrew and Feste, I, I should say, the fool is also partying. Um, and Maria comes to stop them because they're being loud, and she gets goaded into joining in because she's she's a fun gal, right? Um, anyway, Malvolio comes to tell them all to shut up. And and then here Toby has another famous line of his, which is, uh, Dost thou think, because thou art virtuous, there shall be no more cakes and ale? This is a really good line. Saying, like, uh, you think just because you abstain, that means that everybody is going to, that, that it, the temptation is just going to go away. You know, it's really good. Um, and you know he's just being his churlish self, and so Maria decides that they should they should prank him, they should punk him for being such such a jerk. Um, and Toby says, "Oh, I love that idea. If you come up with something really good, I'll marry you." A lot of ways to play that, you know. Is is it? Are they flirting? I've seen productions where they they just flirt the whole time, and it was sort of like destined that they were going to get married anyway. And then I've seen productions where he's like, "Ha! I'll marry you if you come up with something funny." Because I know she wants me, and she's lower beneath my station, being a servant, and I am, you know, I'm a, a, a sir, I'm a lord, and anyway. There are different ways to play it, is my point. 
And different ways to play that whole relationship is my other point. All right, so Act 2, Scene 4, um, Orsino is uh, the same as he's always been. He's melancholy and in love, and melancholy in love. And uh, we've got music playing here. Play on. He asks, um, he asks Viola here if she's ever been in love, and she, uh, <laughs> she hints pretty hard. Uh, this scene is, is often performed, uh, as very sexually charged and sexually confusing and therefore funny, um, to, to the audience who knows, uh, what they do not know. Uh, anyway, he bids Viola, uh, to try again, to, to try again to woo uh, Olivia. And uh, uh, Viola says, what if I cannot convince her? What if there's another that might love you as much as you love Olivia? And Orsino very cockily says, women can't love the way we men can. Uh, and says that their love is just, is just an appetite um, instead of, perhaps instead of a need. Um, you know, it, it, it comes and it goes, uh, is his derogatory um, reference here. And Viola is like, no, you're wrong, dude. In faith, they are as true of heart as we. Uh, he said, or she says, my sister, my sister loved a man as it might be, perhaps, were, were I a woman, should I love your lordship? It's like, oh my gosh, like, how much more obvious can you be? I, I mean, if I were a girl, I would think that you were like, like pretty great or something <laughs> it's funny um orsino asks did your sister die because viola is talking about her in the past tense kind of and viola uh cleverly responds to this and says i am all the daughters of my father's house and all the brothers too which uh, can be a sad moment because you know she's thinking about about her lost brother here Anyway, and then and then she's off. She's back to Olivia's to try again. In uh, Act Two, Scene Five, um, we've got we've got the the prank on um, on Malvolio. Um, he's <laughs> when they find him, he's he's been practicing his behavior to his shadow. Um, which is just funny, period, because he's, he's practicing these manners, you know, to, to his shadow. But uh, anyway, he's, he's also, he's pretending to be the lord of the house, um, even before he finds this letter. You know, the letter kind of confirms all the things that he thinks that he is fit for. Um, they didn't, they didn't spawn them in him. Uh, when he, when he does find it, uh, he slowly, you know, talks himself into believing uh, that Olivia loves him. Um, he talks about her writing, and there's actually a terribly, terribly crass joke here about her C's, her U's, and her T's, uh, through which she makes her great P's. And it's it's a penmanship joke, but it's also, anyway, it's, it's very body. Um, and he, I, he doesn't realize that he's doing it because he's such a, you know, he's a Puritan. And so the funny part of the joke is that these three goons that you see here, you know, um, Feste, the fool, the fool, um, Sir Andrew and uh, Sir Toby Belch are all watching him and laughing hysterically at him while, while trying to hide themselves. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, it's another, it's another great question for a director and, and for actors, you know, is, is how do you stage this? Because they're on stage viewing him, but he's not seeing them. Um, you know? You know? You know. Anyway, there's a very famous quote, another famous quote here, um, that people love to take out of context. And I promise I'm not trying to point out every single dirty joke in this play. If, if we did that, we'd be here for a lot longer than, um, 42 minutes, but um, there's, there's the quote that says, some are born great, 
Some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. And that's a dick joke. That is a 1600 version of a dick joke. That's just, that's just the truth. Um, my absolute favorite thing, by the way, is when people take quotes out of Shakespeare like this and, and try to use them in this esoteric way. Um, and they don't know the context. And so then it's just super funny to only me and other Shakespeare nuts, I guess. Bardolators. But, or Bardolators? Bardolators. Yeah. Bardolators. It's a term for people who are obsessed with Shakespeare and think he can do no wrong. I am not one in that I don't think that he can do no wrong. And I don't... I, I will tell anybody who asks um, that he's he's crass. He's not just pure high art. But anyway, I'm running low. I'm running low here. We got to get this going. Okay, my final thought that I'll leave you with is that this scene is very, very similar to the scene in Much Ado About Nothing um, where the fellas trick Benedict into thinking, you know, that Beatrice has been talking about how much she loves him. <clears throat> now, of course, the difference in these scenes is that in that case it went well and it happened to be true, or at least if it wasn't true, it became true, um, and the men had good intentions. And, of course, here uh, it's, a, it's not quite that, as we will see next week. Um, anyway, I just think it's a great example of, of, a, of a trick being used in different ways. <clears throat> okay, act three, scene one. This is, this is a lot of really good punning. This is, you get to see the fool at his best. So, um, Cesario slash Viola comes back to, to woo Olivia and runs into Feste, runs into the fool. And they have a little conversation here, and it's it's great, you know. Um, and and uh, I guess a, a good question is, do you think she does a good job of keeping up? Because certainly the the fool is an incredibly quick, incredibly witty character, <clears throat> and uh, and she gets a couple really good really good uh, jabs in there too. I think. Um, <clears throat> So there's a line, now Jove in his next commodity of hair, send thee a beard. You know, since obviously since she's a woman, that's not going to happen. Um, but her great response is, by my troth, I am almost sick for one, though I would not have it grow on my face. Which is great. She's sick for a beard. She's sick for, for a man. Um, in, that, in that she's in love with Orsino. Um, she's pining after a beard, but not her own. Uh, and then... Uh, Feste, Feste also very cleverly begs another coin by saying, thank you, you know, for, for tipping me for being funny. If you give me a second, surely the two of them will mate and breed more. Um, and that's cute. And she's like, well begged, here you go. That's great. Um, and then there's the whole church taper thing, which we've already gone over, so I'm not going to say it again. Um. So, moving on. We see Viola as Cesario trying to woo Olivia uh, for the Duke some more. Um, but the, I guess the thing to ask yourself and, and the thing that the actor asks themselves is, 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 there, is her heart in it? She certainly does want to please him. Um, but, but she loves him herself. You know, if she's successful, then she loses him. And yet, as we've talked about, something about her does enchant Olivia. And Olivia, you know, confesses her love to Cesario, who who says, "Madam, I am I am not I am not what I am." Anyway, big crazy hullabaloo scene here. I'm gonna leave it at that. <sighs> Let you go. Have a nice day, night, whatever it happens to be, and thanks. 
mostly for putting up with my rough go of it on this one. I don't know what's wrong with my brain today. Okay, I'm going to turn it off now. Bye.